Først heter Alexander Husøy. Jeg er lærer og spillpedagog ved Nordlig Vigrigård skole. Og i dag så har jeg fått lov til også å åpne opp litt og introdusere hovedtaleren vår før i dag. Og nå vet jeg ikke med dere, men for mig så er en konferanse som dette her, det er litt som julaften og bursdag på en gang. Uh, and I'm actually going to switch over to English now because our uh, main speaker for today is an international guest. Uh, and as I just said in Norwegian, a conference like this, uh, which emphasizes the value of both coding and uh, coding and games in education, that's sort of like Christmas Day and, and the birthday all at the same time. And now today is, in fact, uh, my birthday, uh, which, thank you. Uh, and uh, the Center for ICT and Education, they've actually given me a gift that's going to be pretty hard to top uh, for my friends and family. So sorry about that, friends and family. Thank you, guys. Uh, Center for ICT and Education, because I've got the pleasure of introducing, uh, introducing a man who's been a childhood idol of mine, uh, which I appreciate very, very much. Now, I could take a few moments here to talk about uh, Sir Ian Livingston's advocacy to get coding and computing into the curriculum, which is awesome. I could devote some time to his many accomplishments, many accomplishments within the digital game industry, which is also awesome. But to me, Ian, uh, Ian Livingston is an idol for a whole other reason. Now, Ian Livingston, he got me and probably swaths of other boys growing up in the 80s and 90s reading books. And that is an accomplishment. <coughs> now, uh, as an 11-year-old boy with a very limited interest in reading, Ian Livingston's fighting fantasy book series was my gateway drug into literature. I remember spending hours and days defeating goblins in the Forest of Doom and traversing the Desert of Skulls uh, in the Temple of Terror. And I know that this is a shared experience for many men of my generation. Now, I am certain that Ian Livingston, he will continue to make significant contributions to education, though I must say, from my perspective at least, what uh, you have done for teenage male literacy, oh, and at least for my literacy, is going to be very hard to top. It's my delight to welcome Ian Livingston here today. Happy birthday. <laughs> Great. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I brought my umbrella, I brought my Wellington boots. It is a glorious sunny day, so even better. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my life in games. Um, I've been in 40 years, so that's quite a long time. And why I see games goes way beyond entertainment, um, how games can be used, and obviously as a learning tool. And also talk about the sort of social and cultural impact that games have had on society. Um, I'm not quite as old as this, but uh, George Bernard Shaw said, we don't stop playing because we grow old, we grow old because we stop playing. And that's very true because when we enter this world as babies, we interact with this world. We learn through play. Play is natural and I think helps define us as who we are as human beings. As we get older, we enjoy solving puzzles. That's still very natural. Our curiosity to solve problems and puzzles is, is very powerful. And when we attach rules to puzzles and play, they become games. Uh, I joined the games industry not long after chess was invented in 647. Um, I started a, a company called Games Workshop with two old school friends. Um, Steve Jackson on the left here, uh, John Peake in the middle, and the really handsome guy at the far end, that's me. 
And uh, we want to turn our hobby of, of playing games into a, a business of, of making games. So we published, you can see here, this full-color glossy magazine called Alan and Weasel. And we sent it out to everybody we knew in games. And one of the recipients, although we hadn't sent it to him directly, was Gary Gygax, who lived in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Now, Gary had created this game with a fellow designer, Dave Arneson, called Dungeons & Dragons. Who's familiar with Dungeons & Dragons? OK, so I don't have to spend too much time explaining the wonder of D&D. Role-playing game, um, impacts on your imagination like no other game. It's a huge milestone in gaming history. Here's a game that suddenly allowed people to have sort of interactive theatrical experiences, role-playing these character types of heroes and wizards and, and going on these incredible adventures of the mind, killing monsters and finding treasure. And, of course, without Dungeons & Dragons, would there have been the world of Warcraft as we'd know it today? Clearly, the impact of, on the whole gaming industry owes a huge credit and debt to D&D. Uh, &D. So we went over to the States. Uh, this, we went to Gen Con, 1976. Um, in this particular photo is Steve, my business partner at the front. There, John had left at this point because he actually didn't like Dungeons & Dragons. He wanted to do more traditional games, so it's left to Steve and I to to carry on workshop. Uh, Rob Koontz, who wrote many of the D&D rules. Uh, Professor Barker in the red t-shirt, who created a game called Empire of the Petal Throne. Next to him, Gary Gygax. Uh, and next to him is Fritz Lieber, science fiction author. The worrying thing about this particular photo is the people all to my right are all dead. And, <laughs> and I'm next in line, which is a bit of a worry. But um, no worry, I'm still here. We also got to meet Miss Wisconsin, 1976. <laughs> Uh, I don't know what she's doing, but I'm here in Bergen today. Um, <laughs> and so we came back and uh, operated of our, our tiny little office in Shepherd's Bush in London um, because we'd been kicked out of our apartment by our landlord. Of course, back in the 1970s, there was no mobile phones. We didn't even have a phone in our apartment. It was just a, a phone on the ground floor, um, which we shared with our landlord, Paddy, who was a... Irish landlord who liked to drink on a Friday in particular. So the phone would ring, always going to be a telephone cell for Dungeons & Dragons. Steve and I would just fly down the stairs, always too late. Paddy would get there first. Hello. <laughs> ah, you want Games Workshop, do you? You can go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we, we quickly learned the, the value of public relations being uh, important. So um, long story short, we got kicked out of our flat because they got fed up with uh, parcels arriving and people coming and going. And uh, we had to make a choice um, whether to have somewhere to live or somewhere to operate of, out of because it was very difficult to raise finance for the games industry back then. It still is today because of the finance institutions don't understand the value of intellectual property, certainly in, in, in the digital sense and because they don't understand the, the intangible assets of, of the IP that we create. And yet, what we do create can be incredibly uh, valuable over time. So Steve and I ended up having to uh, talk to the bank manager. He goes to the bank manager and says, hello, we've got this great game. It's a role-playing game. You kill monsters and, and you find treasure. And it goes on and on. And he looks at you rather like a dog watching television and has no understanding of what you're trying to do. So we lived in our van. Uh, uh, which was Steve's van for three months, parked outside a squash club next to this office. And th those, those days were still great, very exciting. And anyone who I say who goes into the games today must be prepared to make sacrifices, but not see them as sacrifices. If you enjoy, if you're passionate what you do, it should drive you on and make you successful, hopefully. So we opened our first um, retail store in April 1978. Um, this was in Hammersmith in West London. I'm hoping to do a sort of Abbey Road reunion shot one day. Um, anybody who was in that queue, um, obviously you're all too, too young to have been there. I found, so far found two people, and we're going to do that uh, reunion shot one day. However, it might be a little bit challenging, because if you go past it today, it's now the Bosnia and Herzegovina <laughs> Community <laughs> Advice Centre. So you might have to use a little bit of Photoshop to get that one done, but um, never mind. But not to worry about workshop, um, very successful now. I'm no longer uh, with the company. We, Steve and I uh, sold out in 1992. But it's now a publicly quoted company, and it just shows the power of, of, of role-playing games and tabletop battle games 
on, on children's imaginations. We wanted to take a role-playing game to a much wider audience. Um, we'd been the exclusive distributors of, of Dungeons & Dragons for three years, um, and we realised how powerful that was, uh, and we wanted to take it to this much wider audience. So we came up with the Fighting Fantasy Game Book idea. Um, these were books um, that were different. These were books in which you, the reader, were the hero. Um, rather than being a passive experience where you may or may not like the hero, these are books in which you made all the choices. So at the end of each paragraph, you had to make a choice, turn left, turn right. If you found a key in one room, you'd be able to open a door further on in the corridor. And so there were hundreds of ways of progressing through these books, but only one correct way. And that was very compelling because it, it uh, gave the, the power to the reader. And this is one of the things that really got me into the education today, just seeing how reluctant readers um, suddenly became really excited about reading books because of a very short attention span, plus they were engaged in the story themselves. And so it's also inspired creative writing, um, and, and people wanted to get into the games industry. So it was that strange word, gamification, effectively the gamification of, of literature. It was a branching narrative with a game system attached to it. And um, 17 million copies were sold, and here's my friend here. Death Trap Dungeon was my favorite book as a child. And um, so that was great that 17 million people have bought the books um, in 32 languages. Um, you'd think very successful. Got a whole bunch of children reading books, which was great. So you'd think the media would be excited about this. And yet, at the time, um, it wasn't. The Evangelical Alliance uh, published an eight-page warning guide about the books, saying that because you're interacting with ghouls and demons, you're going to be possessed by the devil. Um, a worried housewife in deepest suburbia phoned in her local radio station and said that having read one of my books, her son levitated. So the children were thinking, for one pound fifty, I can fly. We'll have some of that. <laughs> and uh, the local vicar of Penguin Books uh, threatened to chain himself to the railings until they were banned. Of course, I'd like to thank them all for their amazing publicity. Um, without which it wouldn't have happened because Penguin Books themselves didn't really promote the books. So history has never been particularly kind to, to, to games. Um, in the 1850s, Scientific American um, said there were much better things for people to do than, than play uh, chess. And when it comes to video games, of course, the, the media goes into an apoplectic frenzy when it thinks about uh, games. Uh, but they would never do that about um, film. Of course, there are 18 rated films, there's 18, there's uh, uh, adult content on television, and yet only 5% of games carry an 18 rating, and yet the media always tends to focus on those few titles that do carry an 18 rating. And games with an 18 rating, of course, shouldn't be played by children, and, and as responsible adults and parents and teachers, we have to give guidance on what is suitable for children and what isn't. Having said that, uh, a game like Grand Theft Auto, uh, a great British success story. It generated a billion dollars uh, in, in three days of sales. Uh, it was a large entertainment franchise in any medium. It's still kind of a, a pastiche of American society in many ways. It's a great technical and artistic achievement, and yet it was mainly criticized in the press, which is a, is a great shame. Uh, I moved into uh, video games from um, analog role-playing games um, Initially, in the, in the mid-1980s, Death Trap Dungeon was number one in the, in the children's uh, bestsellers list, and the startup company, Domoc, uh, asked me to write their first game, which was Eureka. And I joined the company uh, after exiting from, from workshop in, in the early 90s. And Domoc and three other companies got, kind of got rolled up into one company, which was called IDOS, which we floated on London Stock Exchange. Of course, IDOS, most famous for launching uh, Lara Croft Tomb Raider. And again, what started off as a simple sketch by Toby Gard, our artist at, at Core Design, became a, 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 you know, a billion dollar franchise. And that's another thing that we should enable our children to do, is to understand the value of the intellectual property they do. And so many studios are, are work for hire. They don't retain ownership of their IP. And you can only build real value in your companies if you do own your own intellectual property. So Lara Croft, of course, um, survived the test of time in the same way that uh, James Bond survived the test of time. 
in cinema, a huge franchise, um, merchandising with incremental revenue coming from um, merchandise and, and films, of course, uh, two blockbuster films starring uh, Angelina Jolie. I did get to meet her a couple of times on the set. I'm still kind of recovering from that. <laughs> Um, but they were hugely successful. It was a very tough job uh, uh, guiding Lara through her life, but uh, somebody has to do it. Uh, so, video games, where did they actually come from? Well, it was, you know, this is kind of a brief history, but in the 19, early 60s, Steve Russell created this uh, simulation in his laboratory, two spaceships with limited fuel. Uh, and rockets are kind of battling it out, but that was never commercialized. It wasn't until Nolan Bushnell came along and launched Pong in the early 70s. And I think this sends many messages really to games developers of today. Um, so they won't enjoy playing games. Uh, it, clearly it wasn't sold on its graphics. And I, when people say to me, what are the three most important things in a game? I will say gameplay, gameplay, gameplay. Technology and graphics play a supporting role. You would always buy a game that looks terrible but plays well over a game that looks great but plays badly. I mean, that's the essence of the game, is the gameplay, that magic fairy dust that makes you want to come back and play. Plus, with Pong, you could, you could learn it very quickly. Avoid missing ball for high score, and you're able to play, and multiplayer. And I think a lot of developers try to impress their friends these days and make games overcomplicated, and, um, but look back to, to Pong and what it did. So... Um, the Atari 2600 dominated the arcades in the 70s and in the States in particular. Um, the Japanese, uh, always looking to iterate, um, dominated the arcades in the late 70s with games like Space Invaders and Asteroids. And today, of course, the super powerful consoles, Xbox One and PlayStation 4 and games played on PC, uh, dominate the, the, uh, the high-end graphics, uh, sort of interactive cinematic experiences, which is great to see. But the rich are getting richer. You know, the FIFA's, Call of Duty, GTA are getting bigger. Um, it's a mature area now. The, the small publishers have, have been struggling. Uh, there's not much room for B titles anymore. Um, but it's still a very viable proposition. But console games have been intimidating for many people. No one wants to appear to be stupid. And so for some, it's just too much to have a control with, with, with many buttons on it. And so they say they wouldn't play a game. So it, it ran the, demi the domain of originally from, from teenage boys and then it grew to uh, young adults. But it was still a niche market, a large niche. And then along comes Apple, of course, uh, with swipe technology, really nailed the user interface, and suddenly anybody could become a gamer. So you only have to look on public transport now, uh, people playing games everywhere, which is great to see because it's really widened the market opportunity. So games like Candy Crush, who plays Candy Crush? Yep, you're not alone. Candy Crush generates over a million dollars a day, as does Clash of Clans. So games have moved from a niche uh, to a mainstream uh, market. Uh, young children play games, uh, young adults play games, old people like me still play games. Everybody's playing games, which is good to see. There's over a million game apps around now. I, Sometimes get up to 100,000 people uh, watching uh, eSports live on huge screens, which are being, uh, the gameplay is being streamed to you know, hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of people watching these games on, on Twitch. It has over 100 million uh, subscribers. Uh, Steam has over 100 million subscribers, PC download games. Um, it's a big market, $100 billion a year. It's the largest entertainment industry in the world, and yet goes largely unnoticed. And the thing about games is that it's constantly evolving through technology like no other entertainment medium. There's always new opportunities that come along and suddenly becomes a new games platform. Um, Facebook became a huge game, games platform, mobiles become a huge game platform, and VR is, is the next talking point and opportunity. But beyond entertainment, beyond the economic impact games have made, I'd also like to talk about the social and cultural impact that games have had and how games can be used as a learning tool. Games are social. We sit around, we're enjoying playing games together. Games has become a recognized art form, especially in mobile and PC, where small teams are able to create new content uh, and find new audiences and serve games in, in, in new ways, which is good to see. 
Um, BAFTA in the UK recognizes games as, as an art form. Um, there's the BAFTA Games Awards uh, every year now, which is gaining momentum all the time. Games require you to problem solve. You cannot get through a game without solving problems. It's impossible. And problem solving, as we know, is very powerful for children. Games give you continuous assessment, um, your instant, instant feedback on how your performance is. And rather than being demotivated, like sometimes we are in a class, and being punished for making a mistake, games allow you to fail in a very safe environment and almost encourages you to want to try again because you're rewarded for that success. Um, games allow you to take control of particular management um, problems. So a simulation like Roller Coast Tycoon, where you're actually building a theme park, putting up the rides, um, all the amusements inside there, the staffing, setting the economic levels, the pricing points, and by adjusting that economy, you just find out whether or not your theme park is profitable by the number of players coming in and spending their virtual money. And by messing around with, the, with that game, people can see what works and what doesn't work. So it's giving control, again, to, to the user, which, again, is a great learning experience. Uh, games like SimCity, where, if in a, say, in a typical geography lesson, the teacher says, today, kids, we're going to do urban regeneration. And you can just see the color drain out of their faces. But if you give them the opportunity to do something like SimCity, where they can m manage an urban economy and all the infrastructure and see the impact of their decisions, that's done in a much more fun and engaging way. Uh, games like Civilization. So rather than learning dates uh, and bits of history by rote, you can actually see by what effects your actions have on history by playing games like Civilization. Um, games can be used in a very serious way, uh, an applied way for training teachers, and uh, training, sorry, pilots and, and, uh, and surgeons and the armed forces. Uh, you can simulate anything and obviously allow to fail without any terrible repercussions. Uh, games, as James was saying last night, uh, you know, enable incredible creativity. Um, children building these wonderful 3D architectural worlds, um, digital Lego, in effect, and sharing them with their friends is also a great learning opportunity. So without thinking about what's happening when they're playing game, um, games in the media are seen as trivial, but they're actually a great learning tool. All these things that are happening when you're playing game, the, the problem solving, the, the, the risk-taking, the imagination, the, the multitasking, intuitive learning, um, learning as a result of your actions and being able to try again. You're able to fall many times in order to walk. No one's telling you how to do it. You're doing it by discovery, and that is much more powerful than applying stuff to memory, which you'll only forget, in my opinion. So it's a case of hands-on Minds on, and games can be very powerful uh, for motivational in old people in particular, and for rehabilitation. There was a program uh, on UK television a month ago, Horizon, which is a science program, and they were they were looking at whether violent games make you violent, and the the conclusion was that um, you might have heightened emotions for a very brief moment in time, like you would in the same way if you were playing. Uh, if you are arguing about politics or arguing about football, but those emotions quickly subside. There's no long-lasting effect. And in fact, in old people, they said they did some MRI scans. They, they wanted old people to play games on a tablet for about a month, and they checked the MRI scans of the brain and said their capacity had actually increased over that time because of the multitasking that they're doing and the problem solving. It generated a lot more activity in their brain, so the cognitive process was actually improved by playing games. And the conclusion was that in the future, doctors might be prescribing tablets to play on rather than tablets to swallow for, 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 for old people, which is great. And if there's anybody who still doesn't think games are a good thing, I'd like to show a brief video of a great charity in the UK for which I'm, ambassador, I'm an ambassador called Special Effect, who do enable children with severe disabilities to have a quality of life they wouldn't have unless it for the modified technology that um, special effect use. And it's a triumph what they're doing in, in the UK.
for that special effect. So hopefully one day we'll get this headline in our popular press. Maybe not in my lifetime. Um, so we know that games are enjoyed by children. They love to play them. But how do they actually make games? Well, I'd argue that the UK is particularly a creative nation. Our film, our fashion, our music, uh, our games, uh, publishing, television. Um, and games, I think, is a the perfect embodiment of the fusion of arts and sciences. It brings these disciplines together that all is talked about as being separate together to make this beautiful interactive experience, bringing storytelling, art, uh, technology, uh, games engines together to make this incredible interactive experience. Um, I was uh, chair of the Computer Games Skills Council for Creative Skill Set for seven years. And we mapped out every university in, the, in England, uh, in the UK, that had the word games in them. And of those 144 courses, uh, we could only accredit 10 as being fit for purpose. A lot of them were uh, games about um, being seen as a, yeah, the, the cultural impact of games or a little bit about Grand Theft Auto and society, a little bit of design. But what we need as industry is hard skills, uh, programmers, artists, and animators. And so it simply weren't enough. So I went to Ed Vasey, uh, the UK uh, culture minister, who's been a, a great supporter of, of the game industry and the creative interest in particular, and told him the plight that we were having to outsource so much uh, or employ overseas programmers for, for the games industry. And uh, so he tasked Alex Hope and I. Uh, Alex is the CEO of Double Negative, a visual effects company in, in the UK, uh, to write a review which was published by Nesta, uh, did, who did seven um, large studies for the report. And if you want to download it, you can get it from nesta.org, just put in uh, NextGen. And we realized we wanted to look at the whole of the uh, education system around programming and, and digital creativity. And we realized it wasn't just about our own particular industries, and it wasn't about uh, using technology. It was how we were going to turn our children from being consumers into creators of technology. And there's another book by Douglas Shrufkoff, um, Programmed or Be Programmed. Do, want to be, do we want to direct technology, or do we want to let ourselves be directed by it? Because we're really at a critical point. Everything we touch now is controlled by technology. There's an exponential reliance on, on, on tech. So do we want to be in the driver's seat or the passenger seat of that uh, new age in which we're living? So you know, a, a simple car has got 10 million lines of code in it, and we're always hearing about uh, fighting cybercrime, um, how we need to be uh, able to deal with that. And if you look at, uh, at an internet minute, what happens, the millions of, of uh, Facebook posts and Google searches and tweets, uh, it's an extraordinary amount of stuff happening. So we have to be in control of that. We have to be true digital citizens. So with NextGen, we looked at the whole talent pipeline from, from universities. Um, and we were wondering why fewer and fewer children were applying to study computer science at university. And realized it was because of ICT as was taught in schools. Now, <coughs> I don't want to comment, of course, on what's happening in, in Norwegian schools. But what I can tell you is what was happening in, in UK schools is that ICT was largely a strange hybrid of office skills. Uh, uh, even though children learn their lives through social media and their, their mobile phone, phones, against all odds, we were being boring them to death with the narrowness through which ICT was taught. Uh, serving them up Word, PowerPoint, and Excel uh, was effectively teach them how to read, but not how to write. They could make an app. They could use an application. Had no insight to make their own application. They could play a game. They couldn't make a game. So I was doing them a huge disservice. And for the past 30 years. Um, this had just been allowed to happen. Um, be using other people's software was never going to get you a job in the games industry, for example. So I'll show you a, a small amount of this film we made to support uh, Next Gen when we released it to get our point across.
think all the special effects are made in America? I think all the big video games we've made in China, Japan. Special effects and things are usually don't usually do them out of this country, places like New Zealand. Video games are probably made in Silicon Valley around San Francisco. America. China. And Japan. America and Japan. America. New Zealand. Japan. San Francisco. Now I think we've come an age where we can actually be proud of what we're doing because we are creating great content which is culturally, socially and economically important to this country. In a digital age, schools and universities are failing the creative industries. There are a few shining examples of best practice. What we want to try and do with this report is make those shining examples the norm. One such example of best practice is a primary school in Girvan on the west coast of Scotland, where pupils are learning a whole host of creative and technical skills whilst making their very own video games. I made the biker follow a path, but Kodu has to stay off that path so he doesn't bump into the biker. I've made a game with a factory with bikers coming out and then I'm a, I'm a jet and I'm trying to reach that star. This game's design project wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for forward-thinking teachers like Avril Denton. I think Kodu is more motivational with teaching a lot of these skills, problem-solving skills, math skills, language skills. It motivates them. Problem-solving, puzzle-solving, choice and consequence, intuitive learning, management, simulations social aspects and even dexterity. They are a great thing. They're coming here and they're learning how to create games and they can then go home and create games or play their own games. You feel really special that that's your game being played by different people. I would like to make games for people to buy them all over the world. It's opened their eyes really because the children have realised that you know this is a job that they could do and they're, they're starting at a very early level but they can see right I could, I could go on and do this for a living. This is Sackboy. He's a familiar icon of the digital age to millions. He's the star of Little Big Planet, a game which enables anyone to create a world of their own. He sums up the creative power of video games, even for the youngest players. Little Big Planet has been recognised with countless industry awards, including several BAFTAs. Technical director Alex Evans and creative director Mark Healy put their success down to an eclectic mix of artists and programmers working side by side. Traditionally, you divide it into code, art and design. We decided that the more people we could hire who could do two things in those kind of categories, the better. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you can program, but you're an artist. Yeah. Um, I can't draw, but I wish I could. And so there isn't really a sense of awareness that you're in different jobs. You, you have slightly different strengths. Alex's path into the games industry was something he pursued off his own back. He believes that if he'd had the opportunity to make the most of his passion in computing at school, it could have transformed his entire educational experience. The partitions between subjects are quite strong, and um, I wish someone had said, yeah, you're allowed to use your computer to write music for your music GCSE. To me as a child, that would have been awesome, because for me, programming and learning graphics and uh, all the stuff I ended up using in my in industry was stuff I did at home, away from school. Secondary schools don't seem very aware of this kind of thing at all. I mean, I think they're very like, you go and do English, you go and do history, like quite kind of traditional. It would have been helpful if I'd known that I could have taken my hobby to a different level at that point. I think they need to understand that you can do art and technical and be successful at the same time. What we would love to see is more people understanding that that means that from the very earliest stage of education, art and sciences go together. Group learning goes with that because that's part of how we work in industry. What we're trying to achieve with this report is to create a culture where that is understood, encouraged and incentivized right the way across the education system. An educational establishment steeped in tradition, Merchant Taylor's Independent School for Boys is famous for its high academic standards in subjects like classics and history. But the school recognises 
the importance of teaching programming to meet the needs of careers of the 21st century. We have many children for whom computing is a passion, it's a hobby, it's as relevant to today's children as stamp collecting or chess was to a previous generation. If you look at the applications that have conquered the world in the last decade, Google, Facebook, Twitter, they've come from the combination of computer programming skills with creativity. It's by turning out children with that sort of versatility, rooted in traditional academic values, but who are applying those values in a new, technologically-based society. But as Kim Blake from Blit... So our main recommendation with uh, NextGen was to put computer science on the national curriculum as an essential discipline, because this was nothing new. In the 1980s, uh, the BBC Micro was a cornerstone of computing in schools, in the homes, everyone had a Sinclair Spectrum. And this was an affordable, programmable computer. And these two devices gave rise to the UK games industry and made a significant impact in uh, creative computing at the time. Um, but because NextGen had been commissioned by the DCMS, the Department for Culture, Media and Sports, um, the Department for Education, who actually makes the changes, um, said, no, uh, ICT is fine, kind of go away, um, do something else. Um, but uh, being a stubborn northerner, I wasn't going to give up with that. So I formed the Next Gen Skills Coalition, uh, backed by Yuki, uh, the Games Trade Association in the UK. And we got some big hits on board who are also having the same problems finding enough software engineers for their businesses, including uh, Google, Facebook, and Microsoft. And um, we were able to get Eric Schmidt, the chairman of Google, to reference our report in his Matt Taggart lecture in the Q&A of that. And he said that he was flabbergasted to learn that computer science isn't taught. Uh, a standard in UK schools, and of course, if Eric says it, it must be true, and the Prime Minister echoed his words a month later in a speech in Tech City, and that then opened the doors to me to see um, the Department for Education and met Michael Gove, the Secretary of State, as was then. Not always Mr. Popular in education, but for this, I think he should be congratulated because he understood, finally, the simple thing that, you know, use is not making, and we have to get kids into creating technology. So he disapplied the ICT curriculum and last year um, in English schools it came mandatory uh, by law that all primary and all secondary schools are required to have computing on the curriculum, which could be transformational, I would argue, for the country. So what's happening right now, uh, we're kind of on liftoff, um, at least the rocket is on the launch pad, we're heading for the moon but it can still explode on takeoff. So it's really is up to us as, as industry practitioners, to education, um, to anybody who can help to make it happen because the Department for Education have stepped away. They realize they're not able or equipped to deliver. So we helped um, create the new curriculum and hopefully has enough creativity in it to not be not yet another boring science. It should not be all about uh, grey beers writing databases for banks, of course. So what exactly is computer science? Um, well, as Edgar Dyson said, computer science is no more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes. Uh, the, the, the computer is a tool for allowing it to happen. Computer science is, is a discipline. Um, it's, uh, you know, the main things about it is it's not just about computers. It's the, the computational thinking, the problems, the sequencing, the logic, and getting children to find many answers to problems, not just one answer. And um, it's, a, it's a way of thinking. So I would argue computer science is the, new is the new Latin because it underpins the digital world in the way Latin underpinned the analog world. And as I said, it's not just about uh, computers. Um, the poor chap with the uh, locked in syndrome who wrote uh, Diving Bell and the Butterfly was able to communicate through his transcriber. All he was able to do was to wink one eye and they optimize the alphabet, so the, the, um, the most commonly used letters required the least winks, and through that they were able to write a book. So that is simply what an algorithm is. And we want to get children learning it younger, because we need more women in technology creativity, and so it has to still be a cool thing to do, so we need to get to a very early age and enjoy, understand the joy of creativity in technology before it becomes too uber geeky for them in later life. So, who's going to teach the teachers? Well, that should be a reason, not be a reason not, not to do it. Um, 
I think the children would be appreciative if the child, if the teachers recognise that there's always going to be someone who knows more about it than them, and they should facilitate a group learning experience where they're learning alongside the children, uh, beyond the four walls of the classroom, hacking their own curriculum, and creating content. Because there's incredible resources everywhere, from Khan Academy to code.org. It's all free and it's all accessible. And as Alex was saying in the film, is why sh should children be doing all their fun learning and the stuff that's actually useful for their lives in the workplace outside of school? We've got to have some of that stuff in school, allow them to learn some of the good stuff. So there's some great initiatives. Google put $50 million to make with code. Um, there's over 100 million people have, have gone on to the hour of code with code.org um, in, in the UK, the BBC Micro, uh, Microbit. Um, the BBC are giving away a million of these devices to all 11 and 12 year old children in the UK. Um, so they'll be able to do some sim uh, simple programming with an input device, um, creative skill set with a, a game based uh, around mathematic uh, mathematics and teaching algorithms. We've got to have more code clubs in schools, again, having a much, much more sort of game jam approach to understanding how this subject works. And there's another great organization, Digital Schoolhouse, is operated out of London and they're going to expand. And I'll show you a little bit about what they're doing about teaching algorithms. In the workshop the that we're doing today is Animating Algorithms. It's a workshop that's broken down into two parts. The first part is a computing unplugged workshop where students will learn about algorithms using um, algorithms in our daily lives and P-Bots. And then the second workshop is one that's a practical workshop using the DIY Gamer Kits. The overall aim is for students to actually understand what an algorithm is and how to break down a problem and solve it using step-by-step -step instructions. First of all, they'll learn about what daily algorithms are, such as brushing their teeth or playing a DVD or something like that. We're encouraging them to think about what they do on their daily routine and how it's not just automatic. They're, it, they're actually breaking a problem down and actually doing it step by step without realising. So something like brushing their teeth, that there is a moment of realisation when they see how such a simple, what they thought was a simple task, is actually quite a complex routine. They then use that knowledge to then go on to write their own algorithms for a scenario. So they're identifying different steps and then from that they go on to work with uh, B-Bots. B-Bot is like a tiny robot um, in the shape of a bumblebee and um, it has uh, keys on its back which you can press to program it to move. We provide the students with a scenario. The scenario will tell them what the B-Bot has to achieve. It gives them the problem and they have to write down the steps and the instructions and then they go ahead and program the B-Bot and see whether or not they've correctly instructed the B-Bot to do what it's supposed to do. They're an educational tool used mainly by primary schools but we use them with our girls in year 7, 8, 9 and it's a really fun way to learn how algorithms work. So, Digital Schoolhouse, um, I won't talk a bit about it now but I'm applying to open my own free schools, a separate foundation to do that, to build on all the work we've been doing with learning by doing, um, problem solving, creativity and computer science. Because schools are no longer like this, nor should they be, um, but a lot of that persists, that mindset persists, the sage on the stage, limiting the children's education to the limitations of, of what the teacher has to offer. So, as Richard Riley said, teaching children should be learning skills um, for jobs that don't yet exist, rather than being uh, taught skills for jobs that will no longer exist. Because Generation Z is different, they are the connected generation, prolific use of social media, bombarded by data, there's no question that they're different and they, they behave differently and they need to be taught differently. And Einstein said, the only thing that interferes with my learning is my education. He also said, education is not the learning of facts but the training of the mind to think. We all know that so much knowledge is out there at the click of a button, so we have to teach children how to process that information and how to fact find and turn that into real knowledge. We hear in the media about robots are going to replace all the jobs of the future, uh, uh, in particular, um, and yet we're still in many ways turning our children into robots and they're going to have to compete with the real thing so they're likely going to lose that so they, they need to learn how to think and become problem solvers. Knowledge of course is important, literacy and, and, and numeracy but know-how to my mind is equally important. We have to be great communicators as, 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 as in, the, in the workplace and 
don't trivialize play. Play is very powerful. Let's bring that playfulness into the classroom. And collaboration is not cheating. It's how it happens in the workplace. And we're always told that you can't cheat, you can't, you know, the answer in the back, back of the book, as Ken Robin would say, uh, don't look at it because that's cheating. And let's get more engaged learning. Um, my interactive books got children reading. If you start them off with, with Shakespeare, chances are you put them off, off, off reading for life. Get them to love the, the medium first. Um, let's do the right thing in mathematics, for example. Quadratic equation, you're all, all mostly teachers. Hands up who can do this. 10%. And yet, your teachers, you require all your children to learn this. We do, it's upside down. We shouldn't have to do the computational bit. We've got these devices that can do that. But we worry about these devices in the same way that they're probably worried about pencils when they came into the classroom, because pencils are technology. We have to teach them why, when, and where to use these equations rather than how to do the computational bit. So, skills to my mind is as important as qualifications, the practitioners are as good as the commentators. What we have to do is get children to make things, do stuff, build a website, make a game, something robotics, um, make an app. And imagination, don't limit their imagination. Make sure that the art is prominent in the, in the classroom. Um, never underestimate the contribution that art, music and drama makes to diverse thinking, uh, self-expression and self-determination, the very raw materials of the creative industries. Let's embrace science and technology. It should no longer be a question of either or because it's that magic wonder that comes from bringing them two together. The polymath, is, as Eric Schmidt uh, referenced, you know, Leonardo da Vinci was not only the world's greatest painter, he was also a mathematician and engineer. Einstein, theoretical theorist, enthusiastic violist, and philosopher. And let's not punish children from their mistakes. So failure is just success, work in progress. You know, Angry Birds was at Rovio's first game, it was their 51st game. Allow children to fail and reward them. Don't punish them for their mistakes. And let's embrace our differences. Together we can do great things. If this exam was uh, to push the tree over, of course the elephant wins. In this case, it doesn't. But if we combine our skills, we can do great stuff together. We talk about equal opportunities. Uh, in the analog age, it was difficult. In the digital age, it's possible. Any child, no matter how disadvantaged, could become a digital entrepreneur. You know, with their inquiring minds, give them the right creative skills in, in digital, uh, give them an entrepreneurial spirit, give them an attitude of mind, a mindset that they're not afraid to fail, and let them collaborate and Hopefully one day they might become a job maker rather than a job seeker. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Ian Livingston, for a uh, really, really interesting uh, talk. Now, uh, Ian Livingston will be having a follow-up session, a fireside chat or a pace pot uh, with... Uh, Tourguer Waterhouse up in the studio on the third floor in an hour. So I'm sure you'll be getting quite a lot of questions up there as well. Uh, we have a small gift for you. This is a set of uh, uh, right. Google Cardboard goggles with the awesome oh, IC fantastic. Center for ICT thank Education logo much, on it. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Uh, hi. Da er det en kort kaffepause. Nu har vi spist oss litt inn, men uh, det, klokka ti begynner det egentlig uh, neste sesjon, så det får være raske. Det er presentasjoner her. Så er det som i går, um, det er noen presentasjoner og uh, fireside chat oppe i studio. Uh, det er spillworkshopper i Norge, 